from the campus studios of Sarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tisha. Hello and welcome to another Ropecast. I'm Roger Charlton, and today, in place of Peter Tisha, my usual partner, I am very happy to welcome back my brother Neil, who's returned to Germany once again, and we're making use of his visit to record something of interest to everybody. Hi, Roger. Hello, Neil. Great, great to be here. Yeah, good to have you.、Um, I've been thinking for weeks and weeks now. There's something we could talk about because there was a strange coincidence some time ago, at about the time and in Britain, the first results of a teaching excellence framework for universities was published. In Germany, German universities, representatives of German universities, rejected any idea of assessing teaching quality in a similar way. I read about the TEF、yeah. uh, in the British educational press, and obviously it's of interest to me. I'm I'm a governor of a sixth form college in England. Yeah. So all of our students, sixteen to nineteen, progress to do A levels, the equivalent、yeah. of Abitur here in Germany, and we are assessed as a sixth form college on the percentage of our students that progress into higher education、right. or、yeah. higher training of some、yeah. kind. So we're absolutely comfortable with being assessed on that basis、yes. as, as a college institution.、Yeah. Universities are rather less happy about that, but、um, I think what is already clear from this、uh, teaching excellence framework is that some of the problems stem from the way the assessment is conducted, rather than the basic idea of assessing quality. So, what what sort of criteria are in the TEF then? Well, there's quite a long,、uh, quite a big student component. So they're assessing. Teaching quality via how students receive the teaching they're offered at universities, right? And of course, there are certain well-known problems with this. If you think about the United States, where there's a long tradition of including student ass- assessments of even of individual instructors, and it's pretty clear in the United States there is a risk of what they call grade inflation, because students tend to assess highly instructors who give good grades. So then, instructors are tempted to give good grades in order to get good assessments, which might be important for tenure and other、uh, aspects of life at university. Yeah, and there's all the anecdotal evidence about dodgy things that happen between lecturers and students as well. Well, you can leave that on one side, perhaps, and deal with more solid evidence.、Um, what is also clear from、um, sociological research is students tend to give female instructors. A lower ins-、uh, assessment than males、It、may not be a huge difference, but there is a statistically significant difference there. And certain ethnic groups also tend to suffer. So students' assessments are far from unbiased. Right. Of course, they bring along their personal baggage. Well, compare that with my college in England, where obviously the the external body that inspects all schools and colleges, Office for Standards in Education, Ofsted,、yeah. completely independent of government,、um, but has this task of reviewing all schools and colleges as regularly as possible. And we were inspected back in March,、mm. and not only were all the teachers interviewed and the governors were interviewed, but significant numbers of the students were interviewed、yes. as well. So the student voice was regarded as an important part of the assessment、yeah. as to how well the college was doing, and none of the lecturers in that college felt any problem at all about students being asked,、mm. anonymised, but nevertheless being asked about the quality of the teaching which yeah. they received. Yeah. So it was definitely part of the overall assessment framework in the, in England. Well, the other thing about the new assessment、uh, excellence framework in England is that they look at How many students go into the kind of employment that is regarded as desirable or suitable, having、um, graduated from university? And there, I think there might be a problem with the time frame. If you want、um, these assessments to be made relatively close to the period you're, you're thinking about,、um, how how long after graduation would you consider it to be、um, a good job? Do you do you take the first job they go into, or do you? Allow them to really find their feet and, and get the employment they really want. So I think that is a slightly problematic me- metric as well, although regarded as objective, I think, by those who introduce this. 
I can see the difficulty there. Somebody who graduates and maybe goes into a teaching job, that would be, in inverted commas, suitable and progressive mm -hmm. and all the rest of yeah. it. Whereas somebody who gets a job or part-time working in a, a McDonald's, <laughs> that presumably would be described as not suitable. That's something you could do straight from school, for example. Yeah. But obviously, in the English press, you read the anecdotal evidence about graduates working in, in kitchens and mm -hmm. uh, serving in McDonald's. Well, our time is running out uh, for for this podcast, so um, I think perhaps we might come back to this topic sometime, because I think there's a very interesting cultural difference between the UK and the US on the one hand, and Germany on the other, with regard to who is comfortable with assessment like this. Well, I would like to know how some of the English universities have come out of this first round of assessments as well. Okay, so let's come back to this sometime soon. Okay. Thank you very much, Neil. Goodbye. Goodbye. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial.